Hello. Today I am welcoming you into my home to talk about the Reverend William Forbes Marshall, better known as W.F. Marshall. He was a Tyrone man, born in Six Mile Cross in the 1880s to the Victorian era. He went on to become a much loved Presbyterian minister. He was a broadcaster and he is perhaps best remembered as a poet and I'm sure some of the poems that we'll look at today might be familiar to you. Through his writing, W.F. Marshall celebrated his county with its beautiful scenery, its love-struck bachelors, its musical townland names. Tyrone was always close to his heart, although as we'll hear, he lived away from it for a number of years. He lived up in Castle Rock, um, up on the north coast, but his heart was always very much in County Tyrone. It's the place he comes back to again and again in his writing. So we're going to begin by st starting off with one of his poems, which is called The Hills of Home. I'm going to be reading the poems to you throughout this talk from this little book, which is called Living in Drumlister. That's actually the name of one of his best loved poems. But this collection by the Blackstaff Press has been reprinted multiple times. And today our poems will be from this. So this is The Hills of Home. The Lord beat back the rolling sea, and made the world for you and me. He made a power of level land at Porty Down and at Straban. And then, with heather, peat and stone, he built the mountains of Tyrone. So travel up or travel down, you'll see them rising all around. There's ones in other parts I've heard, that mortal big that you're afeard. But even when a man's his lone, the hills are friendly in Tyrone. The dairy man, I hope, is proud of sparrow tops that touch the cloud. Still, when I see behind the barn the big brown back of Mullock Arn, I'd let him keep, while she's our own, the whole jing bang outside Tyrone. There's Bessie Bell. She rises steep. You see her well from Cooley Sweep. She wears a very pretty crown that's changing now from blue till brown. For looks, I'm certain sure there's none to beat Big Bessie of Tyrone. The rest are kindly, wee and low, where you can hear the moor fowl crow. There's glens among them, man, they're prime for shelter in the winter time. For by, when frost bites till the bone, there's piles of turf in dark Tyrone. Aye, God was good made level land at Porty Down and at Straban, but knowing folk he thought black shame to make the country all the same. And so, with heather, peat and stone, he made the mountains for Tyrone. So as you can see in that introduction, W.F. Marshall is just celebrating the landscape and comparing it to other counties and thinking how beautiful it is and how fortunate he is that God made Tyrone so pretty with its friendly mountains. So, W.F. Marshall then, born in May 1888, he was the second of three sons. Now, his mother Mary died when they were young. His brother Robert was six, he was five, and wee Fred, the youngest, the baby, he was only three. So the boys were raised by their father and by a domestic servant. They attended Six Mile Cross National School, where their dad was actually the headmaster. And then they went on to the Royal School in Dungannon, again right in the heart of Tyrone. To this day, one of W.F. Marshall's poems is the school song, and they sing it on speech day and on other occasions. So let's have just a couple of verses from this. It's RSD, Royal School Dungannon, a school ballad, and it's on page 58 of this book. So just the first couple of verses. Sing the good old shanty, boys, wherever you may go. Sing of crown and castle, and an ancient date below. Sing it with a chorus so that all the world may know we learned the Holy Latin in Dungannon. Hurrah, hurrah, Dungannon wears the crown. Hurrah, hurrah, the castle and the crown. When Derry was a village and Belfast a little town, we learned the Holy Latin in Dungannon. So there he is again, putting his town right at the very heart of Ulster life, a true Tyrone man. After he left the Royal School, W.F., with his older brother, went to university in Galway. They probably got a scholarship to take them out to Queen's College as it was then, now um, the National College of Ireland in Galway. 
he spent a lot of his time there playing rugby and when the teacher said to him would you not be better at the lectures taking notes he said sure my big brother can do the notes he liked being out in the rugby field he was a very social man and you know he was academic naturally but he also enjoyed the other the, the lighter sides of life after he graduated with his degree in arts he went up to presbyterian college um, the theological college in belfast just out the back of queens to do two more degrees one in divinity and one in law. So like the other author, C.S. Lewis, a contemporary, he also got three degrees. His brother, R.L., again one of his best friends, he also attended Presbyterian College and R.L. was known as Big Marshall and W.F. was known as Wee Marshall. At this point, the youngest brother, Fred, he emigrated out to America. This was 1911, the same year that in Belfast everybody was thinking about the launch of Titanic, launched in the 31st of May 1911. This was also a period when Ulster was facing some political and constitutional issues. This was the era of the third home rule crisis. W.F. Marshall was a unionist, but he was also liberal, very liberal throughout his life. He had always advocated the ideals of the United Irishmen back at the time of the 1798 rebellion. He was a liberal man, very open in his, in his outlook. But he joined the Ulster Volunteer Force in Six Mile Cross and he travelled to Belfast in September 1912 when people were coming up to sign the Ulster Covenant. In fact, if you go online to the Ulster Covenant, you can see his signature there, signed Six Mile Cross. This was also the period of the gun running. And strangely, for a Presbyterian student at the time, W.F. Marshall got involved in the distribution of the guns. Let me read you a little extract from something he wrote himself at a later date. I have never passed the white gate of Ochnacloy Mance, that I have not thought of the night when I was laden with a thousand rounds of Mauser cartridges. It seems almost incredible to me now, but I carried these for more than a quarter of a mile. The ammunition was being distributed and I had offered to take charge of a full box. I was just about able to lift the box, but to carry it was beyond my power. I filled every pocket on my person with cartridges, including the large pockets in my overcoat, and in that way I disposed of hundreds of rounds. I was about halfway from the town when I met two policemen. They stopped, but then passed on. The excitement lightened the burden and brought me as far as the gate of the manse. There's no fool like a young fool. I smashed the shelves of a perfectly good bookcase and buried rifles on it. So isn't it strange to imagine that this Presbyterian student was involved in that UVF gun running? Short time afterwards, he completed his studies at Assembly College, at the Presbyterian College there, and he went on to be licensed in 1912 and took up a post at Bally Macarrot, which is just in East Belfast there. The following year, he received a call to administer back home in Tyrone, back at Ochnacloy Presbyterian Church. Many years later, when he was reflecting on his time in Ochnacloy, he recalled this. I was ordained in Ochnacloy in 1913, and that world was different. Country life was quiet, the roads were safe, if they were not good, and the white dust of them lingered on the hedges. We had only just stopped staring at motor cars. Shawls were common, so were flails. Cinemas? They were for cities. The jaunting cars still rattled to the fairs. The solitary motor car that served our district was reserved for people of more importance than a licentiate, and I was well content to sit behind a pony. So the next year then, 1914, the Great War began. The youngest of the three brothers, Fred, this was their baby brother, he returned now from the United States of America in order to enlist. And just two years later, at the age of 27, he was killed in action at the Somme, and he has no known grave. That must have been a terrible blow to W.F. and R.L., the loss of their baby brother, and maybe some of that sadness is captured in the very poignant poem, The Lad, and that is on page 49 of this book. So let me read The Lad for you. It begins by talking about scutchers, and scutchers were people who worked in the flax and um, dressing process. The scutcher was, you know, after the flax had been lifted from the fields, it went to be scutched before it would go on to be spun into linen. So he begins by talking about this lad who was the son of a scutcher. They were no great offset anywhere, the scutchers, times ago, for drink. It followed the most of them that rocked among the toe. Plenishment, dead of little or none, like 
except for what they'd steal. And they'd make the children go out and beg for Gaupin's oaten meal. Gaupin's are handfuls. I know the scutcher that rocked in shame. He was a drunken scrub. But he reared a son, and I mind that son as a wee smart lump of a cub. His clothes were wings, and his cap was tore, and his fire was the fire at the kill. And he went to school on his wee bare feet, and he never got half his fill. Above the mill was a queer big hill. He could see to the graveyard wall, to the market house and the station gates, and the new Hibernian hall. You'd hear him singing going up the hill, but the dear knows why he sung, for the people thought they would see the day when his da was sure to be hung. When the twelfth was near, he'd march the road with his drumsticks in his hand, and boys he was prime at the double roll on the lid of an old tin can. He played his loan, for the other folk was ashamed of him in his rags. So he trinnled the hoop and he waited the burn and he ginnelled for sprickly backs. I mind the year he took up with me. The ploughing had just begun. As I watched him leading the horses round, the drunken scotcher's son, little I thought that afterwards, more than a son he'd be, for his father died in a water shock and he come to live with me. He was odd in a way. I think he heard what nobody else could hear. And he seen what I could never see, the more my sight was clear. The top of a hill bewitched him still, and the flame at the mountain's rim. But a run and burn was the best of all, for he said it sung to him. There was them that went as far as to say he was sure to turn out why. But the wee lad grew till he grew man big, and he kept the heart of a child. The longer he lived about the place, the less I had to fear. There was never a word from him to me but done me good to hear. But I'm feeling old since he went away, and my sight is getting dim. I never asked her to keep him back when they needed men like him. He's sleeping now where the poppies grow, in the coat that the bullets tore. And what's a wean of medals to me when my own wee lads no more? Very poignant poem that, isn't it? Very sad. Okay, so I'm quite sure that young Fred was in W.F. Marshall's mind whenever he was writing that, writing that poem. So, 1916, war was still on. Young Fred was killed. Saw what happened. It was equally a momentous life in Reverend Marshall's life. He was called to be minister of the congregation in which he had grown up, Six Mile Cross. And again, you can imagine that would bring challenges going to minister to people who you had known your whole life. But he also got married that year. He married Susie McKee from Belfast. They had a very happy life together and had three children, Charles, Margaret and John. Ten years after that, in 1928, he went to Castle Rock. He was called to minister there up on the very north coast. This was a long way from Tyrone. And his homesickness, his yearning for those friendly hills of Tyrone is expressed in a lot of the poems he wrote at this period. Let's have a read now at Tully Neal. Tully Neal is on page 123 of this wee book. It's quite a long one, we'll just do a couple of verses. On that green hill in dark Tyrone that lifts its shoulders broad Above a house of weathered stone, a plain old house of God the winds embroider now the lee, the cattle come and go. Crab apple blossom, fair to see, warms up the white thorn snow. An oak tree lifts his ancient head in majesty sedate. The maple leaves are furnace red down by the churchyard gate. And that te deum, sweet and strong, that follows lifted rain, is in a lofty blackbird song, far answered up the lane. And so it continues, there's another good few verses in that one, but you can imagine that he is remembering this. Now he actually contrasts it in a way, he talks about the beauty of Castle Rock. In fact, in this verse he says, there's splendor where the great seas roar along a northern strand and break and pound the patient shore and fill the shining sand. 
but I was born in old Tyrone and love the quiet things. The burn that chuckles round a stone, the song a blackbird sings. So he's absolutely appreciating the majesty of the Atlantic there crashing on the northern shore, but he was, wishes he was back at the little by roads and the wee green hills of Tyrone. Now, the Manset Castle Rock where he was living now was a big house, a place with easy chairs where old friends may stretch out their legs and want to stay. I read that, that's a quotation. In this warm and friendly atmosphere, surrounded by his family, W.F. Marshall did most of his writing. It was quite normal for him to write on a pad set on the arm of his chair with the radio or the gramophone switched on and young people talking and playing games all around him. So it's a lovely picture of this convivial old grandfather, father, family man sitting in his armchair at home, not worrying about the noise. You can maybe hear some noise. My neighbour's dogs are barking in the background there. That kind of noise and disruption didn't bother him at all. He particularly enjoyed sermons and his children's sermons were actually published in a collection entitled His Charger White. All of these, the author, the Belfast author, St John Irvine, once said, W.F. Marshall speaks to children exactly as a kindly, understanding and instructive man should speak, neither condescending to his audience nor rising above its head. He was always a very persuasive and charismatic speaker and he was actually appointed to go up to Foy College up at McGee, up in Derry Stroke, London Derry, to do elocution for the people training for the ministry to show them how they could put the right inflection, the right stress, the right emphasis on their words to carry across the message of the gospel in the most persuasive way. Now it's clarity and meaning I'm going to aim for now. I'm going to read you another of his poems, again celebrating Tyrone, and this one is called Tyrone Jigs, and it's almost like a jig, the way it bounces along. But it's a tongue twister because it's celebrating the colourful townland names that you get right across the county. So this one is on page 99, Tyrone Jigs, and wish me luck with this one. This one really is a tongue twister. Okay. Oh, the iron man came with a sword and a spear and the edge of his iron to carve him a throne. And the words of the iron man stay with his hair, for he christened the places in County Tyrone. So wherever you go, from Caloon to Corbeau, they're tuneful and sweet as a bird on a bough. They set your feet tapping and tempt you to clapping. Oh, stranger, just hark to the lilt of them now. Here we go. There's Cavanamara and Dark Derry Mean. There's Caracatean and Munderry Doe. With Straw Letter Dallin and Cavan Green, all dancing a jig with Craig and Conroe. Oh, there's Curragh McCall and Boma Catal and Mullach Shantullach and bright gore to crumb, while merrily trippin' and up and down drippin' are Sanic and Row and Fernick and Drum. Sanic and Row and Fernick and Drum, where is the like from the moy to the plum? A fiddler could play it, a lilter could hum, Sanic and Row and Fernick and Drum. There's Alt Macossey and Crosh Ballin Ray, there's Bonnie Dun Mullen and Eden Tullowan, and Tully O'Donnell and Tander Agee, with Taddy Nagoal and Derry Cantone. There's Termin Amongan and Tully Nashean, and merry as ever and light on the toe, here they come dancing in rhythm and trancing, Fernick and Drum and Sanic and Row. Fernick and Drum and Sanic and Row, hark to the lilt of them, see how they go, say them out loud or whisper them low, Fernick and Drum and Sanic and Row. Yet if you would fetch me to Sanic and Row or Fernick and Drum, I confess, I'd be eager to see them and happy to go but for reasons I'll leave you to guess. I would rather be back in the streams of Romacken, or knee deep in burnish in back bracken and fern, or tramping the heather in warm August weather, the grouse haunted heather on high phallic urn. Oh, high are the hills in the heart of Tyrone, but the one I know best has a charm of its own. Green hill of O'Neill that my boyhood has known, my heart is with you in the heart of Tyrone. For a cool wind is blowing on Tully Neil Hill, and the flags on the church are unfurled. And a man could be over on Tully Neil Hill, the happiest man in the world. He could sit on the slope where it lies to the sun, or in shade where the crab apples grow, and prefer it to farming in places as charming as Fernick and Drum or Sanic and Row. Come all ye Tyrone men of honour and fame, 
The end of my song is a truth that you know. You may travel afar, but there's always a name that has charm and enchantment wherever you go. For it's tied up with joy that was yours as a boy. It is flesh of your flesh and was bred in your bone. It's your Fernick and Drum and your Sanic and Row and your Hill of O'Neill in your county Tyrone. Well, we got there. We got through it somehow. What a lot of tongue twisters in those townland names. Marshall's love for the Tyrone landscape included its folklore. I'll just give you a couple of short verses from one called The Fairy Hill. And what's unusual about this is that a Presbyterian minister seems to believe in the wee folk. There is a green hill near Tiller Road. It's green with the shamrock that no man sowed. For the she's sowed the shamrock and brought the black bee to make it grow forever on the steep green lea. There's a burn slides by it to the railroad line. A slow burn by it, this hill of mine. And man, it's so shapely, it's so green and so round. You'd know it was the wee folk that set it on the ground. And I know a good man, a good man and true, who had it from his neighbour, a good man too, that just half a year ago, coming from the mill, he saw the fairies dancing on this very hill. So there you are. W.F. Marshall seemed to believe in the fairies. Now you will have noticed, of course, that a lot of his poems are in dialect, dialectal language, Ulster Scots and mid Tyrone dialect. W.F. Marshall was fascinated by the vocabulary that we use throughout Ulster and he actually made a, made a study of it. In his introduction to a verse of poetry, it was ballads and verses from County Tyrone in 1929, he said, The dialect in many of the ballads is from my own county of Tyrone. I don't conceive that any apology is necessary for this. In past days, this dialect was something that the schoolmaster lunged out of us with a cane. Nowadays, the cane is laid aside. Marshall's study of dialect convinced him that we had this wonderful hybrid, the way we speak. There was the Shakespearean mid-Ulster English, which he called the Rose, the English Rose. There was the original Irish, which we've always had here, the beautiful Irish words, and he called those the Shamrock. And then there was the influence coming over from Scotland in the years following the plantation, and he called this the Thistle. And the rose, the shamrock and the thistle were the three interwoven flowers which make our language so beautiful and so unique. It was his contention that dialects are not corruptions of English, as so many people seem to think. They are the roots of something that has taken centuries to grow and come to flower. They are the museum of the most useful language in the world. In 1935, W.F. Marshall um, broadcast a series of talks for the BBC. It was called Ulster Speaks. And he invited people to come into the studio and, you know, he studied, he looked at the different ways we talk, the different expressions that we use and the linguistic influences. And this just fascinated the audience. Sackloads of mail and post were coming into the studio and he was trying to answer them all from his Manson Castle Rock. People really engaged with his studies and his interest in dialect. Those talks, those broadcasts were later abridged and they were brought out in a wee booklet called Ulster Speaks. Very rare, very hard to get a copy of that nowadays. I'm fortunate to have one. And the success of that series actually brought W.F. Marshall fame well beyond Ulster. There was an American newspaper which wrote in 1937, It is good to realise that attention is being focused on Ulster dialect as never before. Derivations of words and proverbs are being scrutinised and analysed with a thoroughness akin to that of a research expert in his laboratory. It was actually in recognition of this academic expertise that the Royal Irish Academy elected a Reverend Marshall to the membership in the 1940s. But he embraced these dialect words in his poetry. I'm going to read you a poem called Sarah Ann. And, you know, this is a very amusing poem. W.F. Marshall observed a lot of old bachelor farmers in his journeys around Tyrone. And he kind of caricatures them in some ways in quite a few of his poems. But he brings in these wonderful, colourful dialect, Ulster Scots, Mid-Ulster English, Irish words in the poems as well. So let's have a, let's have a wee read at Sarah Ann. She's on page 73. Listen out for all the, the words in this. I changed me way of going, for my heat is getting grey. 
I'm tormented washing dishes and making drops of tea. The kitchen's like a midden and the parlour's like a sty. There's half a foot of clabber on the street out by. I'll go down again the morrow on McKaylee to the cross, for I'll hate to get a woman or the place will go to loss. I've fathered all the kettle and there's nothing after that but clocking round the ashes with an old tongue cat. My very ears is busy for the time I light the lamp and the place is like a graveyard bar the mayor would give a stamp. So after I be thinking and contriving for a plan of how to make the match again with Robert's Sarah Ann. I used to make wee Robert's on a Sunday after prayers. Sarah Ann would fetch the teapot to the parlour up the stairs and once a week for certain I'd be chopping up the door. There wasn't one would open it but her you may be sure. And then, for all was going well, I got a neighbour man and took him down to speak for me, to ask for Sarah Ann. Did you ever know wee Robert? Well, he's nothing but a wart, a near begone owl devil with a wee black heart, a crooked, crabbed critter that be's neither well nor sick, gurning in the chimney corner or going hop him on a stick. Sure, you mind the girl for Hiram that went shouting through the fair? I wandered in wee Roberts, up in summer anywhere. But all the same, wee Robert has a shop and farm a lamb. You'd think it dead decent when it come to Sarah Ann. She bid me ax a hundred, and we worked him up and down. The deal I hated gear, but a coo and twenty pound. I pushed for twenty mare for buy to help to build a buyer, but you might as well be tacking to the stain behind the fire. So, says I to John, me neighbour, sure, we're only losing time. Just let him keep his molly, I can die without her prime. Just let him keep his doctor, the hungry looking nerve. There's just as chancy women in the countryside as her. <laughs> Man, he let a big travail and he sent us bath, you know. But Sarah busted crying, for she seen we mean to go. Uh, she fell to the crying, for you know she isn't young. She's nearly past her market, but she's civil with her tongue. That's half a year there ways. And here I'm sitting yet. I'll change me way of going. Aye, I'll do it while I'm fit. She's a snug, wheel day and woman. No better in her own. And do I go the morrow from far too long malone. The night, the wind is rising. And it's coming on to sleet. It's spitting down the chimney and the grease shake at my feet. It's whistling at the one day. And it's roaring round the barn. There'll be piles of snow the morrow on more than Mullock Arn. But I'm for tackling Sarah Ann, no matter if the snow was everywhere she bound. When the morrow comes, I'll go. So I hope you enjoyed all the dialectal words in that in that program, Sarah Ann. Most of the humour comes from the fact that Marshall is describing a character with whom it be, you'd all be very familiar with, the bachelor farmer. Now, his studies into language encouraged the Reverend Marshall to work on a dialect dictionary and you know, he'd already worked a little bit in Grant's Scottish Dictionary, but now he started making his own, writing it out as in his meticulous handwriting, the derivations and the origins of all of these wonderful words. And it was just on its way to the publisher, in fact, legend says it was the night before, when his playful golden retriever puppy got a hold of the manuscript. And so it never went to the publisher. And that wasn't entirely destroyed. I'm glad to say most of it survives. And even the wee chewed up bits were removed and salvaged in an envelope. So perhaps one day that dictionary, that dialect dictionary, will be published. Now, the following year, 1943, as thousands of GIs arrived in Ulster in advance of the invasion into Europe, Marshall produced a pioneering book. This book, Ulster Seals West, it's a meticulously researched book. And it looks at the, the contribution that Ulster Scots, people from Ulster, made to the foundation and the formation of the United States of America, the fight for independence. You know, it's a really wonderful wee book, so I'd thoroughly recommend that to you. And then he also wrote a novel as well, this novel, Planted by a River, which would remind you very much of the adventure story, say, Kidnapped by Robert Louis Stevens, something like that. It stars Alec Cunningham. And it's set in the reign of Queen Anne, so just in the early 1700s, the Battle of the Boyne has just taken place. And it's still in living memory, the 1641 uprising. You know, so all of that is referred in this kind of dramatised 
historical novel. It's a real good romp and read. And it's all set in the Sperrins and set in Tyrone and set round Oma. There's chapters in Oma Fair. And so again, everything planted by a river and the river in Tyrone, typical of W.F. Marshall. Now, how do we sum this man up then? What made him extraordinary was the sheer range of his gifts and talents and the breadth of his interests. You know, his poetry resonates with us today, um, just as his published sermons still have a lot to offer to people reading those, his children's sermons, his adult works, his research. But I think he's most loved, most remembered and most loved probably for for his beautiful poetry and his celebration of Tyrone. You know, if you're from Tyrone yourself, or maybe if you're listening to this from somewhere abroad and you're feeling a bit homesick, I really would encourage you to pick up a copy of this book. You can get it online anywhere. Living in Drumlister, the collected ballads and verses of W.F. Marshall, and immerse yourself again in the hills and valleys and the gorse and the bracken and the heather of Tyrone. Although he died when he was in Castle Rock, his body was returned home and he's at rest back in his own beloved county again and his brother, his dear elder brother, is buried there alongside him. And there's a blue plaque today on the wall of the manse, a blue plaque in Tyrone which marks the fact that W.F. Marshall was from there. I hope you've enjoyed it. It's hard for me to cut myself off. I could talk to you for another half an hour and do a lot more readings but hopefully you've had enough to inspire you and thank you very much for joining us here today to learn more about the Bard of Tyrone.